I'm not a diabetologist, pediatric diabetologist, so I'm in the very unenviable position of standing here at the front talking to a room of people who know far, everyone in this room knows more about the treatment of children and young people with diabetes than I do, so let's just be clear about that. I'll explain to you in a moment why I've been involved for over five years in doing research on children with diabetes. I am still a practicing pediatrician. I was covering emergencies all last week, and I do see children with diabetes. Last week, we had three children come in with DKA, one of whom was a 14-year-old girl in recess with a pH of 7. So I do see the consequences of diabetes when it goes wrong, but I don't, I don't look after children day to day with diabetes. I also want to thank all of these people who have helped, because they, many of those do look after children with diabetes, and some of them are in this room, and I'm immensely grateful to them for their help in guiding this research. So this is a talk in really, um, I guess, four parts. The first bit, towards the end, David mentioned perhaps the role of big data. I want to start broadly with big data. I then want to talk a little bit about uh, our analyses of the data that you so assiduously collect and have done for a decade in England and Wales, and both cross-sectional and longitudinal. Then I want to say something about international comparisons, which David mentioned, and then finish very briefly about type 2 diabetes, which is in the MPDA data set, although the numbers are much smaller. So one of the NHS's problems is it has a huge amount of data, but it, it lacks the capacity to deal with it and analyse it. And one of the things that concerned me, there are a number of national audits of which the paediatric diabetes is only one. They're paid for by UK taxpayers. You spend a huge amount of time entering data, and a lot of those data sets have, have not so much this one, but if you look at the adult, big adult audits, the data's collected not analyze much, and how much is it used to actually change care and inform outcomes. So we're awash with data all around us, cancer registries, immunization records, emails, the 100,000 genome project, uh, UCL where I work, UCLH, Good Ormond Street, getting electronic health records, EPIC, that will be even more data. And it's unbelievable. Uh, a petabyte is a thousand terabytes, and a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. So a petabyte is a million gigabytes. My laptop, which is one of the biggest Mac, it's got 250 gigabytes. So a petabyte is a million gigabytes. And the NHS currently stores 50 petabytes of data. And 90% of the world's data was generated in the last two years. It is exponential. So that just gives you an idea that big data does have a, may have a role to play. But I want to pose the question later, of whether it really does give all the answers. So here's one example of why the NHS is just accumulating so much data. Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is part of UCL Partners, it's quite near to Great Ormond Street, it performs a thousand uh, optical coherence tomograms, a scan of the back of the eye, a thousand every day. It's a new technology. It's got ten times the resolution of an MRI scan, and each scan, each individual eye has 65 million data points on a single scan. So that's the kind of data that we're generating. And the world's five biggest companies now don't mine minerals, they don't make cars, they don't uh, fly people on airplanes, they just manage our data. They are kind of virtual uh, companies. So huge amount of data going around the world. Uh, uh, rather different from that Michael Douglas brick size phone, this is what we've come to. You know that Bill Gates famously said, why would anyone want more than 250k of memory on their phone? What, what would anybody do with it, you know? So we're in a, what some people have described as the fourth revolution. The first revolution was the industrial revolution, when people started to use coal and steam to, to uh, mechanize procedures and uh, and displace the, the labor-intense industries that I was talking to David about last night that led to the growth of cities like Leeds and Manchester and Sheffield and Newcastle, these huge industrial cities. Uh, then the electrical revolution that uh, led to assembly lines and, and more of a process-driven rather than a handcrafted industry. I went to, I took a year out of medicine in 1979 to go to Imperial College to study computing applied to medicine and at that time the uh, university had one mainframe computer which occupied a whole room 
and which you programmed on punch cards. And within six years, I had my first laptop. That was the exponential spread of computers. And now we're in this fourth digital revolution. We've had the, the, the silicon revolution. We've got the technology. We've got the hardware. But we are awash with vast amounts of data. And I think, frankly, struggling, certainly people of my generation, struggling to have the skills of bioinformatics to know how to use this data to our best advantage. So I said I want to pose this question. I hear a lot, UCL is a great uh, evangelist for big data. We have the FAR Institute, which is across all disciplines, uh, very much uh, a proponent that big data will solve all our problems. And uh, you'll see from my talk that I'm not certain that's completely the case. Uh, I want to start with why, I said I would come back, but why am I as a non-diabetologist interested in looking at whether big data will help us understand uh, the care of children with diabetes? So I've been interested for some time, uh, really I suppose since 2011, in un what's called unwarranted variation. This was a concept first put forward by Jack Wenberg, at, I think we were talking about uh, Dartford. Uh, New Hampshire, is that right? And Jack Wenberg was there, and he put forward, he was a public health physician who, who looked at variation in care in New England and came up with this idea of unwarranted variation in healthcare service. Variation that cannot easily be explained by either the patient's illness or uh, the evidence-based medicine. Why did I become interested in that? Because around that time, the NHS published two atlases. First, an atlas of variation in adult care, but for me, even more importantly, at that time, I was president of the College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and they published an atlas of variation in the care of children. And I really found this quite shocking. I, I, I kind of thought we had a national health service. I suppose I recognized there'd be some variability, but I had no idea the variability was so huge for quite common conditions. Diabetes, the treatment of diabetes has been around since 1920, since Banting and Best. And it's not, in the UK it's not expensive, unlike the US. The, co the cost of treatment is not the, 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 the critical factor. So variation can be explained or unexplained and can be warranted or unwarranted. And I'll give you some examples of that. If, um, so, sorry, going, going. So, um, here's some examples of warranted uh, variation. Um, can be due to patient preference or patient choice or patient disease. So we see a lot of sickle cell children coming into our accident emergency department at UCLH. Uh, obviously, if you were to look at variation in care or complications, there's hardly anybody in Aberdeen with sickle cell disease, and there's an awful lot of people in London with sickle cell disease. So that would be warranted variation. Or uh, if you looked at the care of uh, young people or adults with, uh, who are Jehovah's Witnesses, you might find great variation in their care, but that's because they choose not to have blood transfusions when they've been involved in a road traffic accident. So that's all warranted. What's unwarranted would be this example I give, that you have two hospitals, let's say the two hospitals in Leeds, both doing percutaneous angioplasty in adults. There's a wealth of evidence. There's a nice guideline. One unit follows that guideline and gets good outcomes. And the other bunch of people think, well, we don't believe that. We, we do it our own way. We've always done it this way. They do it differently and get worse outcomes. That is both uh, unwarranted. It's explained and unwarranted. So, uh, Muir Gray came to the Royal College of Pediatrics in 2011 uh, with uh, Ronnie uh, <coughs> Chung, Cheng, who is now, I think, pediatrician at the Evelina. And they presented to uh, the college their atlas of variation, and I just show two slides. I could show you tonsillectomy or bronchiolitis, or, but you're, you're diabetologists and, and <coughs> diabetic nurses. The percentage of children admitted with ketoacidosis across the previous five years, and this is shown by the horizontal axis, are the 151 primary care trusts that no longer exist, but they're each a small <coughs> geographical part of England. And you can see there's a seven-fold variation in the uh, percentage of children Diagnosed with diabetes, already diagnosed. This isn't that first presentation. These are children already. This is an entirely avoidable complication. And one of only two complications in childhood diabetes that can lead to death. And in the worst performing units, uh, over 40% of their children with type 1 diabetes had been admitted in the last five years. And in the best, I think it was 8%. That's a huge 
variation, very hard to explain. I'm sitting in the audience thinking, I thought we had a national health service. And if you look at the, uh, the details on that, it's again, it's 151 PCTs along the bottom, and the percent of children who had a HbA1c uh, that was uh, less than 10%, 10% or less, again, you can see huge variation in that. And more importantly, Muir Gray and Ronnie showed that you could not explain that variation by looking at the spend on type 1 diabetes care for children in those PCTs. Because everyone's immediate reaction was, oh, well, those units, they've got far more doctors and nurses, and they spend far more on it, and they've got far better facilities. And when they looked at the spend, that did not explain this huge difference. So this came at exactly the same time as uh, I had moved from Nottingham to London, and I'd applied for a grant to set up a policy research unit at uh, the Institute of Child Health. And uh, that was successful. Initially, we got 5 million funding, then 8.6, and now it's been extended to 13.6. And one of the themes that the government wanted that policy research unit to look at was the outcomes for children with chronic long-term conditions. They felt there was a huge amount of pediatric and neonatal research on acute emergencies and acute diseases. But actually, what was neglected were conditions like cerebral palsy, like Down syndrome, like epilepsy, uh, like diabetes, where children had a chronic condition that would last into adulthood and have a long-term impact. And they asked us to do some research, not on diabetes, but on a chronic condition or chronic conditions, to try and explore why was there this variability, how much variability was there, how, did we, how was England, England doing compared to other countries. And so we picked to look at diabetes. Why did we choose diabetes? Well, these are just some of the reasons. It's dichotomized. That means you either have type 1 diabetes or you don't. It's like pregnancy. It's like death. It does not require a doctor or a nurse, unlike asthma. Asthma is a doctor-diagnosed condition or a nurse. Died. Someone puts a stethoscope on and decides whether they hear wheeze or not. That is very subjective. Diabetes is not subjective. Once you've got it, you've got it for life. Uh, it also um, starts in childhood and lasts through transition, the transition through adolescence into adulthood, which is what the government were interested in. It affects about 20,000, 25,000 children, so it's big enough to get good data, but not so common. If you looked at asthma, you would, have just, you would be awash with data. If you looked at uh, Down syndrome, you would probably have too, too few to make meaningful conclusions. Uh, there was the National Audit, which had been running for 10 years, a, unlike uh, what David was saying about the US, a national geographic population cohort with almost 100% ascertainment. Almost nobody, no child in the UK is treated with diabetes outside the NHS. It's got an objective proxy outcome, that is HbA1c, or for that matter, uh, pH with DKA, or, or blood glucose and hypoglycemia. It's got measures that don't rely on me or the child or the parent saying, oh, I think my asthma, my epilepsy is well controlled. It's absolutely objective, not subjective. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, not in this slide, there's certainly compelling evidence in adults that intervening to make the control better uh, reduces the risk of complications and death. The le evidence around children is, is less compelling, and it's a separate talk. It's something we've been looking at and continue to look at. But one could hypothesize that the earlier the intervention and the better the control in childhood, the more likely these young people are to, to survive through adulthood with fewer complications, which is what principally the government were asking us to look at. So what does big data tell us? We've got big data. We've got 10 years' worth of 25,000 children, kind of a quarter of a million, each with thousands of data points. So we're not short of data. What does it show us? Well, we first of all looked at cross-sectional data. So the college first gave us the data, MPDA data, for one year, 2012, 2013. And some of these slides are slightly different from the handout. That's because I was up to half two this morning trying to make this a better talk for you after talking to some people last night. So it's hot off the press. Um, so starting in, uh, this covers 2004 up to 2012. I don't need to labor the point. Uh, it's data for England and Wales, although we were funded by the English government. The MPDA is a joint data set. There's no data from Scotland and Northern Ireland in it. And you can see that at that time, uh, the, the uh, green line 
Our children with HbA1c's less than 7.5%, about 15% of the England and Wales population, with about 30% of children with an HbA1c above 9.5%. So not doing very well. For those of you who still struggle to change between the units, <laughs> especially for you, this is for you, David, okay? <laughs> So uh, I think you said uh, the, the, guy, the, the expectation is 58 millimoles per mil. You divide by 11, it's about 5.5. Add 2, you get 7.5%. So I hope that sticks with you. Because these slides, we span that transition. So the slides uh, use different units throughout. So how much, un or how much variation was there in England and Wales? Uh, you, these are all your units, and I'm hugely grateful to you all for the time and effort. One of the reasons... Justin and Fiona and Greenoff wanted me to come and talk, was just to demonstrate to you that unlike those other national audits, your data is being analysed, is being used, and is being published to try and clarify some of these issues, so you're not wasting your time. Uh, I mentioned that we have this objective outcome, HbA1c, uh, and the covariates are important. You, there was a question earlier about case mix adjustment. So because the, the data set is very rich, uh, we can adjust the data for age, gender, duration of diabetes, ethnicity and deprivation scores and also type of insulin treatment and clinic size uh, whether, you're, whether you were in a network or not and within centre variation. Okay, um, so this is the variation uh, in 2012-2013 across England and Wales. Um, the red line is the average so it's about as I mentioned it's around 9% in, in old units. The black dots are the unadjusted raw mean for each clinic. So you can see there is quite a variation. The best clinics are down at about 8% and the least well-performing clinics are up at about 10%. But more than that, you can see within every single clinic there's huge variation. This is a box and whisker plot. The boxes are the 25th to 75th centile for that clinic and the whiskers are the, the extreme outliers. And you can see that uh, it's called a caterpillar plot because it's supposed to look, or a centipede looks like the legs of a, this is the caterpillar with its legs coming out. You can also see a slide I took out of the pack, but you can see that the best performing clinics also have the tightest uh, ranges. And the worst or the least well performing clinics have huge variation. So that can, you'll see that more of that when we go to international comparisons. That says that even in a poorly performing clinic, there are some children doing really well, down at 6%, but there are some at 16%. And the well performing clinics have tighter control. They don't have children who are very high, as well as having an average that's low. So that's the variation. How much of this variation can be explained? Well, one of our first hypotheses, uh, because it was a common theme of many adult analyses, not just of diabetes, but of stroke care, of angioplasty, other things, is that, is that clinic size will be important. Or if you want to go to Atul will go Wandy's hernia factory, if you do a lot of something, you do the same thing over and over again, you get very good at it. What was the evidence that the control was better in large clinics than small clinics? Well, there is some evidence, but it's not very striking. So the red line is the national average, it's around 9% in old units. Um, the blue line is the regression line, each dot is a clinic and this is called a funnel plot. And you can see that as the clinic, number of children in the clinic goes from a handful to 50 up to the biggest clinics at 300. Uh, on average, the percentage of children with an HbA1c less than 7.5% gets better. But it's a very shallow gradient. It's not not huge. Perhaps much more worryingly in this funnel plot is the number of clinics that are outside the 95 and 99% confidence limit. So when you do a funnel plot like this, if it was perfectly mathematically beautiful and everyone was behaving uh, like a, a, a mathematical model, then 95% of clinics would fall within the 95% confidence limits perhaps. You can see that there are um, uh, a quarter of the clinics, their results fall outside the 95% confidence limits. There are some below the funnel plot, uh, but a lot above it. So clinic size isn't a huge factor. Small factor, but not huge. What about workforce? We, along with uh, Julie Edge and Fiona, we did, um, uh, we repeated the work, Demetrius uh, led this work, repeated the uh, workforce study that had been done before, 
And yes, there is variation uh, between England. Uh, we included Scotland and Northern Ireland in this because it's been done before, although they're not in the MPDA data set. And you can see there is variation in the number of, of paediatricians, the number of dietitians, psychologists, uh, specialist nurses. There is variability. But again, I want you the data, but it didn't make a huge difference to the variation between clinics when we factored this in. It didn't seem to be a huge factor. What about deprivation? I think this is a very telling slide, very similar, and it parallels what David showed about the US experience. So the children in the MPDA data set, uh, or their families, can self-declare their ethnicity, white, Asian, black, mixed race, other, and people who choose not to stay. And you can then divide them by deprivation quintile. So uh, the most deprived children are the light gray bars, poorest children or poorest families, and the black bars to the left are the least deprived, the wealthiest children. So you can see two things on this slide. Uh, if we take the uh, white children first, you can see there's variation between poor children and, wealth, and wealthy children. Uh, it makes about a five millimole per mole difference the red arrow versus the green arrow. Much more worryingly is if you take the most affluent uh, children of black parents or declared black ethnicity, their HbA1c's are the same as the, the poorest white children, so the two green arrows. Every single one of those ethnic groups has a gradient, has an arrow running exactly the same way. The, the, the poverty affects all ethnic groups and then between, variation between ethnicity is that black children do worse than white children. And there's other things in between. So taking all of that and going back to our caterpillar plot, how much of this total variation between clinics can be explained by, by things about the clinic, by, by workforce, by uh, numbers of professionals, uh, money spent, about 5%. Small difference. And if you factor in all of the things we looked at, so there's the crude data, this is the the total variation in HbA1c up the left-hand side in arbitrary units, but how much is that variation reduced when we factor in case mix? It drops by 14%. If we add in case mix plus insulin regime, it drops by another 1%. And if we factor in clinic characteristics, it drops by another 3%. So with all of these data, five years of analysis, all of your hard work, we can explain 18% of the variation that Muir Gray first demonstrated to the Royal College of Pediatrics in 2011. So does big data answer all our questions? No, it doesn't, but that doesn't mean it, it, it couldn't. The data set is the data set. The data doesn't include uh, huge amounts we might be interested in about, for example, children's school performance, parental education levels, uh, nuclear families, extended families, there's a million other things you could look at, so we mustn't say it couldn't answer it, but the data we're collecting at the moment leaves a huge question unanswered about why is there such variation. What about international comparisons? Uh, uh, David mentioned this, so we've, we've done <coughs> studies comparing um, England and Wales with um, uh, uh, the US, Scandinavia, Austria and Germany have a joint registry. Uh, Look, look, see how they do compared to us. And I said I would come back to this thing about both average performance, but also variation around that average. So let's take um, England and Wales. So we've already said England and Wales not doing very well compared to other countries. So the average is around, on, this is uh, uh, millimoles per mole along the bottom. So the average of that red bell-shaped curve is about something around just over 70. And it's a very flat curve, it's spread out, so there's a lot of variation. Some children with HbA1c's up at 85, uh, 90, some down close to 60. <coughs> Compare Sweden, which is always the place we're always envious of. On average, it does much better. It has a, the, the mean of that peak is somewhere around uh, the dotted line is 58, the 7.5% target. So the peak is somewhere just over that, it's about 60. But it's also a very tight, it's not an, a flat bell, it's a very narrow peak. And so the least well controlled children in Sweden 
have an HbA1c something around 64, 65, and the best are down at 53. What really interested us and interested uh, Ragnar and the Germans and Austrians, because I don't think anyone had really anticipated this beforehand, was how flat uh, the, uh, the, the blue is the German and Austria. So on average, they do, the mean is good. It's quite close to Sweden, somewhere around 60. But it's a really long tail both ways. And perhaps reflects the fact that Germany doesn't have a national health system. It has a mix of large university clinics and people with private health insurance and some people caring for quite small numbers. And some of their children really have, have HbA1c's comparable to the least well-controlled children in England and Wales, up at 80, 85. So although their mean made them think they were doing as well as Sweden, it was a real telltale moment when they looked at this that they've got really broad outliers. And the red arrow is just to make the point that sadly our best controlled children in England and Wales are only uh, doing as well as the worst controlled children in Sweden. Um, it does, the story does get better, I promise you. <laughs> uh, and this kind of makes that same point graphically in a different way. The, these are box and whisker plots showing the mean and the, and the variation. So you can see Sweden has a red line, a, a, a low mean around 58, and a very tight box and whisker. Uh, Germany and Austria have a similarly low mean, but have a very wide box and whisker. And England and Wales up there, we have uh, reasonably, somewhere in between Sweden and Germany and Austria, in our box and whisker, but we have a high average. And the, I might explain, I mentioned to you earlier that about 5% of the difference uh, variation in England and Wales can be explained by differences between centres, whereas in Germany and Austria it's around 17-14%. So some centres doing very well, some doing much worse. Okay, the longitudinal analysis, here's the good news for you that you should all be very proud of, and I'm not being sarcastic. This is, this is a huge success story, which owes something to all the people in this room, and the college, and Justin, and all the people who've led this work. The longitudinal data, which we got much more recently, from a decade's worth of data, shows that on average, year by year, HbA1c for children in England and Wales has been falling, and that's something you should be immensely proud of. And if you hadn't collected these data, we wouldn't be able to, to tell that. So that's something to be very... It, of course, the, this graph has a false origin. It doesn't go down to zero. It's gone down from 76 to 69. But in, in world terms, that is a huge achievement. And uh, it makes, for example, the difference between the black children and the white children, the earlier slide, or the most deprived and the least deprived children. These are, these are on public health population basis, these are differences well worth having. They are not trivial. Um, with that longitudinal data, we've been able to look again in a much bigger data set over a number of years at both ethnicity and deprivation. So in the data set, of course, the majority of children are white, slightly more boys than girls. Uh, uh, the average, this is across the 10 years of the MPDA, um, average age of diagnosis is nine years. Uh, average follow-up in this analysis is around two and a half years, uh, but some much longer. Um, uh, insulin pump at five, five years follow-up, or about a quarter on a pump. So what does the, the analysis longitudinal show? So what the analysis shows is it bears out that cross-sectional data, so it's even more powerful now. If, uh, if you look at the, uh, let's just take two lines. So on the whole, I won't expand it, but broadly at diagnosis, there's not much difference. All of these children have an HbA1c sky high, somewhere around 90 to 95, let's say. But if you look at the fall, the honeymoon period, the black line are the black children, and they have the least fall in the honeymoon period. And then, as in all studies of children after the honeymoon period, it starts to rise again. If you look at the very uh, uh, dotted line, which is the white children, they get a bigger fall initially, so they get better control in the honeymoon period. And over the 60 months, the five-year follow-up in this longitudinal analysis, um, you can see that they stay consistently below the black children all the way through, just parallel one another, and for various other ethnic groups in between. And if you look at deprivation, you can see the green line is the uh, most deprived children, the least wealthy children. And the dotted line is the wealthiest children, wealthiest families. Again, the most affluent children get the biggest drop in the honeymoon period, 
and they stay down below everyone else and the poorest children get the smallest drop and stay above everyone else. So I think pretty unequivocal. Okay, to finish, just something very briefly about type 2 diabetes, um, because this is a very big, you know, worldwide, this is a big data set that you're contributing to. Um, one of the things that uh, isn't on the slide, there's been a 15-fold increase in type 2 diabetes in children and young people over the last 10 years. The college did the original BPSU survey 10 or 15 years ago, and we were able to use your data to look at this again. So, not surprisingly, given that uh, a third of children who leave primary school now are obese or overweight in the UK, uh, the, there's been a 15-fold increase in type 2 diabetes in children and young people. It's two-thirds of them are girls, uh, Four-tenths of them come from the poorest fifth of our society. So unlike Hanoverian England or Victorian England when this building was built, uh, when obesity was a, a disease of the affluent, people who could afford to have rich food and a lot of it, obesity is now a disease of poor people. Cheap calories cost nothing, but they're very poor quality. Um, and it's a disease of, of uh, it's a disease uh, far, far over-representation of black minority ethnic children, particularly Asian children, probably related to the thr thrifty phenotype. You can see that too if you go to Mumbai now or Qatar, you can see that in these countries the, the sudden rise in the economic benefits, huge amounts of obesity and, and type 2 diabetes in both adults and children, and we're seeing that in the UK. And if we look at their longitudinal control uh, of type 2 diabetes, this is the uh, for ethnicity, you can see that um, if we take the, the uh, let's take the green line, which is, uh, uh, sorry, the orange line is Asian Pakistani children, so West Yorkshire would be a very good example, and the blue line is white. You can see that the white children uh, and other Asian are the best controlled, but there are big differences between ethnic groups. And you see this rebound that most people see with type 2 diabetes, initially getting some control and then slipping away. And if you look at, uh, even more strikingly, for deprivation, you can see that a diagnosis, the green line, are the poorest children with type 2 diabetes, the, the highest HbA1c's of diagnosis. Uh, the blue line is the wealthiest, and they have the lowest. And although all of them get a little bit better, then get worse, you can see over the four years of follow-up that the poorest children remain the worst controlled. I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take any questions, but I do want to emphasize I really, we all really appreciate all your hard work and effort at contributing all the data that makes these analyses possible. Thank you very much.